Watch this. School is back in session. However, Idaho kids are doing it outside of the classroom. But are they actually learning? And how are parents dealing with their new at-home responsibilities? We're taking a roll call assessment of modified online schooling. Just when you thought you've heard it all with regards to Representative Heather Scott, unless you've heard this, you haven't. And she said it. We're bringing back Get to Know Idaho by going back to a time when Fort Boise was nowhere near the city of Boise. Was it even really a fort? Well, most of Idaho's schools have been closed for more than a month. The first step that we took to stop the spread of COVID-19. Classes have started to get going again, most just this week. And over the last or the next several months, I should say, the state's education officials, they will be looking at what they are calling a loss of learning. With tens of thousands of Idaho students no, no, no longer in actual classrooms, what impact is it having on them? And how might they catch up when they do return to the actual classroom? Joy Prechtel takes a look at the issue. For the past month, Idaho students haven't been able to join their classmates inside of the classrooms. Instead, learning has transitioned to packets or online. And while students are still learning this way, educators are concerned about how far behind students may be academically. But they're not sure how far behind students will be or how many students are affected. Teachers are doing what they can to make up for the lack of face-to-face -face teaching, but Lane McAnelly, who is the president of the Idaho Education Association, says this lacks hands-on learning most of the time. For example, when I taught um, sixth grade chemistry and we did all sorts of chemistry lessons within the classroom, I don't know if my students have access to the different uh, chemicals to be able to mix them. And so they can see me do it on a Zoom call, but they don't have that, that hands-on learning. And so when you don't have that hands-on learning, a lot of times the students don't have their attention because we know when you're engaged, you retain. One of the things the state is doing right now is putting together a group of teachers that can meet and come up with strategies as to what they think is the best way to offset the loss of learning that is occurring right now. Ibarra says that group of teachers could begin meeting as soon as next week. In Boise, Joey Prechtel, Idaho's News Channel 7. So that's the view from Idaho's chief educators. But how is this schooling at home working for the kids and their parents, who, by the way, might also be working from home at the same time? To find out, we asked the mother of two kids who attend Victory Charter School in Nampa. Amber Akery is mom to 8-year-old Cooper, who's in the third grade, and 11-year-old Carter, a sixth grader. They've been back to school since Monday, doing everything online, just like everyone else. Amber, though, has a full-time job and is working toward a psychology degree from the University of Idaho. So she knows how this stay-at-home online stuff is supposed to work. She just didn't think she'd be doing it at the same time as her kids. The teachers um, were really good about giving us emails, updating us kind of on how things were going to work. So that was really helpful. They broke down everything we needed, which was super helpful. They did send us a schedule of what the kids needed to do every day during the week. So that was super helpful. And then the way that they have the online schooling set up is through um, Schoology. So I take online classes for college. So it's a lot like your Blackboard or your Canvas kind of set up. What's it been like for you, though, as a parent to, I mean, this is quite the shift for your kids. So we've had some tears. Um, <laughs> and that was just out of frustration because a lot of what I'm getting is, well, that's not how we do it in school. That's not how we're supposed to do it. And I'm like, well, that's what it says. And they're like, no, that's not what we're supposed to do. And so there's a lot of that going on. So I work while they're doing schooling and I get phone calls, um, you know, periodically throughout the day. And so if I'm on a call and they need help, they just have to sit there and wait until I'm done. Um, and then, you know, it's it's hard going back and forth between being an employee and then being a teacher, you know, slash mom. And I think that's where a lot of the tears have come into play. Is there a good part? The good part is, is that um, I feel like I'm more hands on with their learning. I understand more of what it is that they're doing every day in school, 
without actually having to go to the school and sit there and watch them. Do you worry that they're not getting what they should at this age for the semester? Absolutely. <laughs> Yes, that is definitely my worry because, like I said, I try to be there with them when they're learning and seeing what the teachers do and everything like that. But I can't be there, you know, for both of them the entire time. After they're done with the subject, I, I ask them, you know, okay, show me what you did. And then we go through it. But, I mean, I don't. I don't have a degree in teaching. I don't know if what they're doing is, you know, 100% correct or not. So it's, it's been difficult. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I definitely am afraid that they're not getting the level of education that they need. And they're going to hopefully address that over the next several months. As you heard Joey tell us about Lambert says she and her kids are prepared to round out the year like this if they have to. And this is just week one and she's confident they can adjust to it. She did want to remind other parents out there, though, who are in this same boat. It may seem rough right now, but there are calm waters ahead. She said it's worth rem reminding yourself this is all new to all of us. We're all just kind of figuring it out and tears are OK for the parents and for the kids. And when it's all over, this semester will just be a blip on your kids overall education. Well, speaking of education, perhaps Idaho State Representative Heather Scott should read a history book. She made that known yesterday in an interview with Jess Fields, who's a podcaster from Texas. Here's a piece of that hour long discussion as we introduce a new segment called No Words Necessary. When you have government telling you that your business um, is essential or non essential, and another one, you know, yours is non essential and, and someone else's is essential, we have a problem there. I mean, that's no different than the, the um, Nazi Germany, where you had government telling people you are an essential worker or a non-essential worker and the non-essential workers got put on a train. Mm. Okay, I know this segment is called No Words, but I have to say something here. Are we okay with this? North Idaho, District 1, this is your representative. She is representing you. Are we okay with her calling Governor Brad Little, Little Hitler? Are we okay with her comparing unemployment to Holocaust victims? That was about taking lives. This, asking people to stay at home for a few weeks, is supposed to be about saving them. But it seems there were hundreds of like-minded Idahoans at the state capitol today. The Idaho Freedom Foundation hosting a protest in downtown Boise, as well as Lewiston and Sandpoint. And of course, it goes against the governor's stay at home and crowd gathering order, because of course, that was the whole point. Civil disobedience at the expense of concerns for the common good. And I'm sure the two and a half percent mortality rate of COVID-19 in Idaho does not apply to these people. A line of lights in the sky and lots of them. A plane or a parade of planes? Well, we'll explain what you've likely been seeing. It's caused a lot of concerns for a lot of Idahoans. Ever wonder about stuff? You can ask us anything about Idaho. Just text us here at the 208. The number is 208-321-5614. Include your name and the hashtag the 208. But keep it clean. We might read it at the end of the show.
Phone calls and emails have been coming in by the dozen over the last few weeks, usually in the late evening and usually after dozens of moving lights have been spotted in the sky and the emails look a lot like these two. Kelly Davis asking, so what's going on high in the sky tonight? Meaning last night for over 20 minutes, the sky revealed a huge parade of planes high flying from southwest to northeast at high altitudes. What's this air parade all about? Lisa also noticed she asked, why are there more than 30 planes flying northeast over Boise all in a straight line right around 10 PM? And I saw them too a couple of weeks ago. My kids and I counted about 30 of these lights moving in a straight line from the southwest on a slight angle to the northeast, and they were spaced out almost perfectly. So here's what we found out. They aren't planes, obviously, but satellites. Elon Musk and his SpaceX program have been launching dozens of these Starlink satellites since last spring. The last launch was just last month. We reached out to the Herit Center for Arts and Sciences. Those are the planetarium people at the College of Southern Idaho. While satellites in space are nothing new, they've been there since the 50s. Chris Anderson told us you're noticing these Starlink satellites because, well, they're kind of low and there's kind of a lot of them. And what these are that makes them a little bit different is this is a way to try to give the world Internet without having to rely on ground based connections like cell towers. Is there a reason that we're I mean, we're seeing them so easily? Are they lower than they should be right now? Yeah, so the way that these are going to work is they get launched up into low Earth orbit, and then over time, they gradually move them into a higher orbit. It's still considered low Earth, but it's higher than most satellites. Uh, and so while they're in that relatively low uh, so-called parking orbit, uh, they're brighter because they're physically closer to us. Uh, and then as they get moved to those higher orbits, they're still, they get somewhat dimmer. So eventually they're going to work their way high enough that they won't be so obvious in the sky. They'll be less obvious, but you're still going to be able to see them easily from a dark location. Yeah. And you think you may think there's a lot up there now. Just wait. There's supposed to be another launch next week, all part of the SpaceX's first phase to get 12,000 of these Starlink Internet satellites in space. That's what Chris told us. And when they're done, if all goes according to plan, Chris says, there will be 42,000 of them up there, 42,000. And then he said that's going to pose a problem for studying space with SpaceX satellites potentially photobombing any pictures astronomers will try to take from Earth. Well, we are going to be looking at the Lyrid meteor showers, too, which are continuing. Uh, through this week and into next week. In fact, it should peak by Monday or Tuesday night. That could be anywhere from about 50 to 100 uh, flying through the air at that time, very late night or early in the morning. So, man, just a, an amazing kind of feat. Of course, we get that every year at about this time. We just kind of hope to keep it clear enough so you can see that. I know a lot of people are looking at it. Well, let me start off and show you a satellite picture. Everything looks pretty good. We got this little mark in our armor for a beautiful sunny weekend. Uh-oh. Here we go. Well, let me tell you about it. First of all, as you look at Southern Idaho for tonight, you see that we have basically clear conditions, and uh, this is even into the mountains. So for this evening, no matter what your location here for Southern Idaho, you're looking at some really nice weather for tonight. Now, I think you're going to do the same thing when you wake up for tomorrow morning. You're going to be seeing some very nice weather as well. I'm going to go out to a wider shot here on this satellite, and as we move up over the northwest, you're going to notice that there's a storm just to our north, and there's one that's basically to our south as well, which happens to be over Southern California. Okay, and when that comes in, it's going to be just enough moisture in the atmosphere to produce this. There it is, around Nampa. You can see some of the showers there just to the south, mainly over the Owyhees and the higher country, and that red spot, that could be a thunderstorm. So expect that for later tomorrow evening. After that, tomorrow or Sunday is a bit unsettled with a few clouds in the mountains, but I don't think we're going to be seeing any showers here, so look for some clouds to increase, especially during the day tomorrow. Uh, also, as we see temperatures starting to warm up for tomorrow, we're going to be seeing uh, this storm system, as I'd mentioned here just a little while ago, that's up over the Canadian border and also another one that's in Southern California. As we get a little wider on this shot here, you'll see it uh, there, Northern California or North and 
uh, central California moving up into Nevada. That's just enough moisture from that as well as the storm to our northwest to produce a few showers that could be up in mountain locations. So notice the clouds will start to increase for later tomorrow afternoon on an into the evening, but any kind of shower or thunderstorm will mainly be in most mountain locations. So in this seven-day forecast, we continue to heat up. Looks like it's going to be beautiful for tomorrow morning and temperatures in the 60s, some lower 70s next week. Another storm expected Wednesday. It drops the temperatures again. So here's a question. Why is the original Fort Boise called Fort Boise if it isn't near Boise? And what's the meaning behind this statue? Those are just a few of the questions we were asked, and we've done our best to answer them. Speaking of questions, you have one? Let us know about it. Text us your questions, your concerns, and your comments to 208-321-5614. Make sure you leave your name and include the hashtag the 208. We might even read and answer yours at the end of the show. We get lots of questions from lots of people to the 208. People like Ross Arba, who sent us this text this week. He says, why is the original Fort Boise located just outside of Parma? What does the statue mean? What did the old paintings on the statue mean? Why does it have a lion's head on it? Who, why, and when built the statue? Those are a lot of questions. I get it, Ross. You want to know what's going on out there. But Ross also sent along some pictures. The statue Ross is talking about, we'll get to that in just a second. It was built in 1971. This is the old Fort Boise replica that's out there by Parma. But the sculptors Paul Yaden and Art Jensen, they put together a sculpture that Ross was asking about that is there out in Parma. And it does have a lion's head on it. And as for why, well, we asked local historian Rick Just as we get to know Idaho. The original Fort Boise wasn't the kind of fort you think of today. Not exactly a mansion for military men. It was originally a trading post over near Parma at uh, the uh, confluence of the Boise River and the Snake River. And that started in 1834 as a reaction to another trading post that you've heard of, Fort Hall over in Eastern Idaho. 
That's right, the British-based Hudson's Bay Company wanted to stake a claim to trading across terrain that wasn't even known as Idaho Territory yet, thus the Hudson's Bay flag on the statue. Francois Payette was the fur trader in charge for 10 years. Why'd they call it Fort Boise if it was nowhere near Boise? Well, it was near the Boise River, and the Boise River by that time had, had that name. There's some confusion over just exactly when it got it, but it was known as the Boise River. And it wasn't much in the first place. In fact, to begin with, it was kind of a pile of sticks. It really wasn't much of a construction. It was maybe 700 square feet, something like that, really pretty tiny. It got bigger but it didn't last much longer. So what happened to the original? Well, it eventually got flooded away and uh, a number of things, it just disappeared. Those number of things include an emigrant massacre in 1854 at the hands of the local native population, which might explain the bow and broken arrow on the back of the statue. It wasn't until 1863 that the Fort Boise we know now was built and Boise built up around that. All right, as for the reason the lion head is on top of that statue, still unsure. It's not as if there were lions running around the Snake River Basin at the time. It's more like beavers and otters is what they were catching. But we would need to ask the artist who built that statue, and we tried, just couldn't get a hold of him. But there is a whole park in Parma that's dedicated to Old Fort Boise, and you can check it out for yourself after this stay-at-home order is lifted. All right, today, day 23 of our now 36 day stay at home order. Governor Brad Little extending that this week until the end of this month. After that, well, we'll see. All we know right now is that we don't know what next month holds. That's why we're carving out these sections of the 208 and we're calling it COVID comfort. A little bit of calm in the middle of this crisis. And maybe you can't get out to see some of the spots you usually would. So we're doing our best to bring them to you. And today we're taking you to Freak Alley. 
By the way, if you like this, if you like Freak Alley and getting out and taking a look at it, you will really like the 360 version of Freak Alley that is now up on our YouTube page. All right, lots of long-winded comments to get to here to wrap up the 2-8. Let's get started. What is wrong with your reporting tonight? Uh, I don't know. To comment so ugly about Heather Scott was appalling. Oh, what I said was ugly. Is the business of a single mom who cuts hair to feed her kids not essential? Is the man who owns a workout facility not essential to his family and employees? Who made you God to decide? All right. 39 people have died of the coronavirus. Actually, it's up to 42 now. And yes, a single mom who has to feed her kids and a guy who owns a workout facility can collect unemployment right now to help feed their kids and take care of their family. They're not being boarded on a train. Let's not compare the two. Brian, I don't agree with Nazi comparison at all, but fear is a compelling reason to take shortcuts in all sorts of civil liberties. Worth being vigilant along with being safe. That's from Cecil in Meridian. I agree with that. Yes, we do not want to let our civil liberties be taken from us, especially in a time of crisis. But this is not that. This is doing something to help stop the spread of a disease that's killing a lot of people in this country. Regarding your story in District 1, Representative comparing little to Hitler. 
Although I don't agree with her statement, free speech is a right. Why aren't you singling out others who say the same or worse? We do. That's kind of our agenda here, yes, of the 208. Let's point out some things that people say that they need to be held accountable for, like Representative Heather Scott saying this about the COVID crisis. And this last one, I'm sure my B-17 pilot dad would be happy to drop Representative Scott into Nazi territory so she could evaluate the validity of her comparative claims. We'll just end it right there. We'll see you on Monday.